Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very excited for another episode of the Industrial Real Estate Show. And I just put a tweet on, on Twitter, coincidentally, about the commercial real estate market and some of the news surrounding it right now. Uh, Elon Musk just put out a message saying that the commercial real estate market is melting down. Uh, there was another report that just came out that said uh, office values in New York will see a 44% drop by 2029. Uh, there's even another report from MSCI that said multifamily properties are going down. And I think it's important to differentiate between subcategories in commercial real estate. So I think that there could be some pressures in office and multifamily and maybe some other areas, but industrial is actually faring quite well. So my guest today is going to join me to talk about industrial real estate. And we're going to get into a little bit of the nitty gritty on it, talking about not just the big industrial that distribution centers, some of the properties that are more prominent, at least in, in how we see it day to day. But we're going to get into more of the class B, class C properties, such as manufacturing, a smaller warehouse properties. And we're going to really uh, do a deep dive into this. So with that introduction of the way, I'm pleased to be joined by Jeremy Mercer from Matador Capital. Uh, Jeremy. Hey, how you doing? You. Thanks for joining me on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I'm really excited to just, uh, I always love chatting about industrial real estate and, and I've been following along with Matador Capital for a while and just seeing the type of properties that you have picked up and what's in your portfolio. And what I think is really exciting about your strategy is that you're not focused on buying a 2 million square foot distribution center. You're much more interested in that class B, class C uh, industrial property. So before we get into that, and I really want to do kind of a deep dive into what those properties are, how you analyze them, uh, but even just a little bit more context, can you share your background uh, on how you got to where you are today as a CEO of Matador Capital? Yeah, sure. So I started in industrial B and C properties probably 20 years ago. Um, my, my brother uh, started buying them when he was brokering with uh, a, a brokerage here in Dallas and they started buying some buildings and I started just doing the property management on them. And uh, after about six years of that, I, I kind of got tired of the property management side and I moved into brokerage. And around that time, my brother had started the Mercer company, which is a, an industrial brokerage here in, in Dallas, Fort Worth. And, and so I went to work with him and, uh, and brokered really hard, uh, and you know we were we do sub market specialization there, and and um, you know I was very focused in the Stimmons corridor of Dallas Fort Worth, um, and I ended up just working on in a business you know in a park called Brook Hollow where Trammell Crow developed pretty much all the buildings there, back in the late fifties early sixties. So you know that's uh, you know when I started in the business you know no one cared about those kind of properties. Uh, you know, we had tons of inventory. Um, I mean, I remember in 2010, you could get a year of free rent on a class B industrial building just so that someone would be, there'd be a warm body in the building, you know, that's, uh, otherwise the, the power would get stripped out. And then I would say probably, I guess 2017 is when class B and C industrial started peaking the interest of, I guess, institutional money and all these, all these groups started showing up, you know, on the, you know, the term urban infill and core and all this started coming into play. And what that ended up meaning was just all these old, ugly buildings where I worked, you know, and uh, so all these investors started showing up and, you know, larger institutions. And it's funny, you know, Prologis actually started selling all their assets off in this market because they were so old and then they did a total about face and try to buy everything is you know their strategy was this isn't cool oh wait now it's cool we'll start buying these again and uh it's just kind of interesting and so uh i start selling all these buildings to these investors and you know i, I just got to the point where i was like man i can kind of I, I can do this on my own. You know, it's really, they have money. They don't really have deal flow. They don't have, uh, you know, tapping into that, that side of it. So I'd say, uh, 2020, I got interested in doing my first deal and there's a, there's a, a private equity real estate company here in Dallas called Cantex. And, and, uh, I worked a lot with them and sold them a lot of buildings and they were, they were, gracious enough to let me buy in the buildings and the deals that I brought them. And, uh, and they'd bought a deal that was too small 
and it, you know, it was like a half million dollar deal. And they were like, Oh man, they're like, this is too small. We screwed it up. I said, mark it up and give it to me. And, and I did. And I syndicated. That was my first deal. And, and then I bought one other deal that was about an $800,000 deal at the end of 2020. And then about the beginning of 21, I was like, man, I really, I'm really kind of done with brokerage. I don't really want to do this that much. And, you know, I've done it for thir 12 years now. And, um, you know, I really enjoy buying an asset, putting a deal together. And, and I think I can do this and, and I think I can raise money and do it. And so, you know, at the end of December, we hit, you know, about 105 million in assets, you know, we're close to a million square feet now. So, um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, and just buying those buildings. That's, so that's how I got here today where I'm at. So, well, I, I think that's a trajectory that a lot of brokers envision, whether they get there or not. I think every industrial broker at least has that sense of we should be buying our own properties here as well. Yeah. I mean, you remember the times when you were a broker as well. You don't have a pension, you don't have a retirement fund, you don't yeah. have you don't have anything beyond what you earn as a broker. So the yeah. appeal of using all the information and knowledge you have to apply that towards buying properties is a competitive advantage in itself. So I think that you're, you've done what a lot of brokers wish they could do. So it, we'll explore that a little bit more as well on how, how perhaps anybody can start getting into the field and what you'd recommend for someone if they're wanting to make an investment. But I'd really just love to explore the asset class in more detail. Sure. And before we even jump into defining what it is and how you look for opportunities, when you hear news like elon musk going and saying there's a meltdown and coming in commercial real estate or you hear news uh jamie diamond from uh jp morgan said that it's a huge concern right now with all the potential debt that could come up and declining property values does that is that noise to you when you're looking at industrial real estate or is that concerning to you as something that could trickle into industrial i don't see it touching industrial yet. I mean, I think the big issues that, I, that we're going to face in commercial real estate is, you know, uh, on the, on the office side, you know, they, they talking about office buildings drop, you know, what I see is, you know, there's, there's some industrial users that I've represented before and, and they have an office component to them. And, you know, like one of, one of, one of the clients I represented was, you know, a major hospital here in the FW area. And they said, you know, they had nine floors at one tower in an office. They said, when it comes due to renew that, they're going to probably cut it to two or three. Right. So I think, I think office still has a long way to flush itself out on what's going to happen because anyone that signed a 10 year lease in 2015, 2016 for multiple floor play stuff, give a lot of that back they're going to renew i think but i think they're going to give a lot back so i think plugging those holes in office is going to be really tough that's and so i think you're obviously going to have issues in that asset class and then it seems like multifamily. you know at some point man people just can't pay that much in rent at you know rents are going to start declining i think in that industrial seems to still be pretty pretty strong um the leasing demand is still there in the major markets um you know, uh, or the mar markets that I, that I mess around in. And, um, and so I feel like industrials kind of, you, you kind of always need industrial. And then I, you know, I'm, I have a buddy of mine, he does exactly what I do and he's really credit focused. And I said, you know, when I was managing, I, I was, I had about 40 tenants across 250,000 feet when I was managing properties when the, uh, the, in 2008, 2009, when the financial crisis hit, we only had one guy default. Everybody else like made it through. So I mean, most of the businesses in the in the B and C stuff is you know they're pretty sustainable through this. You know they they ha they're just needed, right? Everybody everybody needs a plumber. Everybody needs an HVAC guy. Everybody needs their car fixed. You know these are these are businesses that you know need to have a, a location. So um, I feel like industrial is sheltered a little bit from it now the run-up and i think the same issue might be coming up at some point in industrial that uh is in multifamily where people just can't pay that much in rent anymore you know i mean i've seen 
what I've seen people coming off, you know, I still work a couple of renewals and stuff like that, that I have for clients. And, and I've seen, you know, people coming from $5 net and they're going to North of 10. I mean, you just, the problem with that is in a small business, say like a 20,000 foot space or a 15,000 foot space, you just took the owner's salary away, you know, mm -hmm. uh, small businesses don't make a ton of money. And so at some point, uh, there's going to have to be some retraction in rents. Um, but I don't know when that's going to be because they keep getting it, you know, and, and landlords here in Dallas are pretty bullish on the fact that if you don't want to pay it, somebody else will. And they haven't seen leasing demand decline yet. So do you see any owners start to pro forma out on on that of any potential and perhaps it's not even a decline, because I think for the most part, a lot of real estate guys like to be very optimistic and maybe even overly bullish. I, yeah. I know I am myself, but what I've seen happen, especially in the multifamily space is that a lot of these syndicators just projected that rental growth was going to go on indefinitely. So they all built their models off 3% growth essentially in perpetuity. And now that they're actually seeing a decline, the whole model breaks down because it was built, even their worst case scenario might have been flat growth, but now they're seeing a little bit of decline in it. And that's when you're seeing over leveraged property owners in this multifamily space that might have to do cash in refinancing. But there's all sorts of negative things that come when you see declining rent growth. Do you see anybody in the space starting to project that when they're running their their five or 10 year pro forma that rents might have to level off here? Or is it still that really bullish mentality that there's still going to be rent growth? Um, investment brokers will tell you that there's always going to be rent growth. <laughs> um, no, uh, I think, uh, I don't know how other guys are pro forming it. Um, I'm very focused on basis on the building. Um, I would think everybody models some kind of rent growth and we're seeing in, in the Dallas market, we see anywhere from four to 5% annually on escalations for, but you know, CB gave me a report that said it's going to be seven and a half percent for the next per year for the next five years. Um, now Dallas has kind of historically been lower than other industrial markets across the country. We've always been a lot cheaper, um, but everybody's always modeling some kind of rent escalation usually we'll model typically three percent and then we'll go ask for five and hopefully get four um on our leases that we sign um but a lot of our strategy is buying the basis right buying a lease that's already way under value and what you know and hopefully it has no fuse on it or a very short fuse where we can go touch it and uh and get that tenant to market so that's what we're trying to that's kind of the whole theory of you know you hear People say you make money when you buy real estate. And and uh, I think that's what we try to focus on is when we buy it, that we bought it right, where we can fix some things, whether it be physically or, you know, on paper with the leases and stuff like that to, to get the value out of them. So, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And beyond Dallas, you're active in Texas and Oklahoma, too, uh -huh. right? correct? So what are some of the other markets that you like right now? So our, our real focus is we just stay on the I we stay on I-35 and that touches all the way down to San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth and Oklahoma City. So those are the markets we play in. Um, we, we like those markets just because the amount of growth of population. Um, also, I down in the Temple Belton area, I have some partners down there and we do some land entitlement stuff. And so I talk with a lot of the major home builders. And so. Um, that's not part of Matador's platform. It's just me and my buddy and another partner that we do these things with, but it gives me a lot of insight of what, you know, home builders are doing because industrial typically follows by two years. And, um, so that's, what's taken us down to those markets. And then additionally, just from an operational standpoint, it's, it's easy to get to for us. You know, if a property manager needs to, uh, go get to Oklahoma city, they can leave it. 8 a.m., be there at 11, handle what they need to do and be back, you know, to their family, back home to their family at night. So just operationally, it, it, it's it's easy to navigate. So do you ever see a future where you go even further beyond that? Or is that just the comfort zone right now? That's the comfort zone right now. I think we we would 
we've considered maybe like towards the border just because of all the trade going on uh, where, where the manufacturers moving to Mexico. And then I do think I think at some point we'll probably start working out of Florida just because we like Florida. A bit, and I can see Nashville, too, that area. Um, we we kind of like to work in places that we want to go visit, right? If we, if we have to go visit our properties, we want to be able to hang out there and have a good time too, while we're at it. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I could see, you know, the Florida markets and then, um, maybe the Nashville area, something like that. So where would you look at a market like California or New York, like these traditionally very large industrial markets, but have had a lot of outflow as, companies have either just got tired of the taxation or the high rates or the culture, but there's still major industrial hubs. Where would you put those markets? Oh, I'm sorry. You brought, say that again. Where would I put those? Yeah. Sorry. I think we had just a bad connection there. Yeah. Where would you put markets like that? Even Chicago, another market with a billion square feet, uh, yeah. these major industrial hubs, where do you, where would those be on your radar of, of interest? Probably not. Um, flight time to New York is too much. Chicago is probably not horrible. Flight time to California is pretty long. You know, every th- I want to be within about two hours, getting somewhere within two hours. Um, there's enough to, to handle there between those markets. You know, going to those other markets, um, I don't know, just probably just probably wouldn't happen just based on not enough hours in the day, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I go to Florida frequently, so I, I know it, I understand, you know, I understand it. It's a lot like Texas to me, you know, I think going into somewhere like California or, or Chicago or New York, you know, it's, it's a, kind of a different set of politics. It's kind of a different way things are done. I don't, I don't know that I want to go learn that. So. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. And, and it's probably the opposite as well. There's probably people in California that don't want to go to Texas or Florida. It's right. You get their own preference and stay within an area they're comfortable with. Yeah. So let's let's jump into class B and class C industrial. Uh, again, I guess the natural thing would be, how would you describe that when you're perhaps raising capital or just someone asks you, what's, what's your overall uh, definition for that? Um, class B and C is going to be probably buildings built before 1975 for the most part, you know, um, just older buildings, uh, is how I describe it. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's all I ever worked on in my brokerage career. And I call it, you know, in a, in a way I like to say this is I get paid to take out the trash and we usually get paid pretty good for that. Right. So, um, not that being there's some really nice BNC buildings, but you just met, you know, there, there's some buildings that, you know, they just don't look that great, but man, you know, someone needs that space, you know, um, there's businesses that occupy those kind of spaces and, um, and, you know, and they're just a lot of them. I think the, the big thing I would, I would explain to people on BNC is there's just not a lot of CapEx that goes into these things, you know um, you know, the, you know, you buy an office building every time your tenant moves, you better get ready to do a whole brand new finish out because everybody wants a new one every time. But ours is, you know, can you do some paint and carpet and fix the toilet, you know, and uh, it's just people trying to go to work and all the work goes out the back door of the of the property, which is the dock doors, you know. So that's where their money's made. So they just they want functionality. They don't really care as much about looks, you know, some, you know, but, uh, you know, we. I, I, that's what I would think describes class B is just functional space for small businesses and medium sized businesses. So when you're underwriting these tenants, how, how do you deal with the fact that they probably want to do shorter term leases and simultaneously, they probably don't have a, a huge credit rating or sometimes no credit history at all if they're a new company. Yeah. So that, that happens in a lot of our small Bay properties. Um, you know, our, you know, we'll buy a small bay park and, you know, spaces are anywhere from a 1500 to 10,000 square feet. Um, usually your tenants under 5,000 feet probably won't have any credit and, um, they're probably starting up and man, I just, I like to see how much cash they have. Like, I don't care as much about their financials that they don't really have because, Let's face it, small businesses are terrible at preparing their financials. Um, 
they, you know, it just them because they're they're an operator. They're not usually an accountant, and you know, they're they're trying to save everywhere they can, so they don't have a CFO most likely. But what I've seen in, and I mean, and I have repped a thousand companies, just tons of companies in that size range. They always seem to make it if they got some cash and the owners kind of got a level head. Um, and, you know, they probably want to do a shorter term lease, which we're OK with in the smaller square foot range, because, you know, they end up, they, they'll usually end up staying or they'll grow with you into another space you might have, um, you know, and then. Uh, but I, amazingly enough, though, in those parks, when we get into the 10,000 foot range, we usually get pretty decent credit on those people. Mm -hmm. um, so but I just like to see how much cash they have. And maybe sometimes we'll do an enhanced security deposit like two months or something like that. So it just depends. So, so you're so you alluded to the fact that a lot of these companies do tend to make it if they've got some cash. Have you noticed that there's a certain turnover rate in the smaller companies versus the more established ones? Man, I've had big companies backed by PE totally go out on me and I've had the small business guy go out on me. You know, um, the difference is, is the small business guy will let you know it's coming. The PE just shuts the doors one day on you, you know, so um, you at least get a sense of it with uh, the smaller guy. So. So with the sizes because i think that's an important distinction as well is that a brand new class a distribution facility the smallest space they might be able to do in there is 200,000 square feet whereas in this class b and c you can get as low as 1500 square feet as you mentioned do you have a certain size range that you like going after like these multi-tenant buildings you 1500 to 10,000 square feet call it or do you does size govern the decision to some extent or how do you make your analysis on what makes a good property uh, it, I like to say every deal stands on its own, you know? Um, so, uh, what makes a good property to me is, is, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily as much as the, the sizes of the suites in there. It's how's it been managed by the previous owner, you know, on a park, how's it been managed by the previous owner? Probably if we're looking at it, it probably hasn't been managed properly. He probably hasn't pushed rents. A lot of owners get very complacent. They don't want to push rents. They don't want to enforce the lease. They don't want to spend money on the property. You know, I always equate it to like, Chad, if, if, if you, um, if you made $50,000 a year before you woke up every morning or a month, if you made 50,000 a month before you woke up every morning, but if you woke up two hours earlier and worked really, really hard, you would make $59,000 a month. Would you do it? Probably not. Right. So that's where a lot of these owners get stuck. They just get stuck. Uh, they pay their rent. They don't bother me. Well, of course they don't bother you. They know they're under market like significantly. <laughs> they don't want to call attention to themselves. Um, so that's what we look for on the parks is can we can we create value within about eight, no less than 18 months, you know, or um, no more than 18 months. Can we touch leases and roll them over? Um, and typically we can. And then a lot of our single tenant assets we look for. We look for a land component to go with it because uh, a building with land is always so much more valuable. So, you know, our. I, you know, in my brokerage career, I worked in a, in a part of Dallas that had a lot of properties that were, you know, a 20,000 foot building on five acres of land. And every deal I ever did was off market. So I, I knew those buildings lease up quick. And um, so that's that's kind of the profile on a single tenant asset we'll look for, you know, um, and the sizes, you know, I mean, I think our, the largest freestanding single tenant building we own right now is 85,000 feet. Um, so we don't really get too much past that. I mean, we would buy bigger buildings like that. We just, you just don't see a lot of that's when you start getting over a hundred thousand feet in uh, class B and C, a lot of it's big manufacturing buildings. So that, that that's very specialized and, and sometimes in what goes into them. So, um, but a building with yard on a freestanding property is what we really like to see. So, How are you finding and sourcing deals right now? Uh, we were, 99% through brokers. Um, you know, I, uh, I've always kind of found that, you know, if, if a broker finds out that we're, you're calling direct on everybody as well, they're, then you're just competition to them. Um, 
And so I like to work through brokers because uh, they'll bring you 10 deals, you know, versus the one you might find on your own. Um, so, uh, you know, my director of acquisitions, his whole job is just a business development brokers the whole time. And, you know, call them all the time, find out what's going on, what are they seeing and have them present us options and deals. So what are you seeing in the deal space right now with interest rates having gone up at I think it was the fastest rate that it went up in the last 40 years. So yeah. it's taken a while for the market to adjust to this higher interest rate environment, at least higher to where it was. I think historically we're still on trend with with, with being pretty low, uh, but with it increasing so fast, a lot of sellers have been very reluctant to accept new pricing versus they still think that they might get early 2022 pricing. Are yeah. you finding deals right now or is it more challenging? It's definitely more challenging. Um, you know, we we bought fifty six million in assets last year. I mean, if we can match that this year, I will be just thrilled. Um, my, obviously, my goal is probably to do more than that, but I don't see I, it's tough. The disconnect is really there, um, and uh, you know, a lot of sellers are regretting not selling in twenty one. Whenever they had all these multiple offers and all that stuff. What I am seeing in some instances is where someone might be asking a price. They're still having a high asking price, but they're taking less now because there's 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 not a lot of activity on your property. Right. It's a, a lot of people just, you know, they, you know, you know, whereas, you know, a year ago or two years ago, it was, you know, they had 10 offers sitting on their desk. And uh, now it's like there's not a lot of people talking to them. So I think they're starting to take less. So some people are either just not doing anything or some people are starting to starting to loosen up. But it's still it's still tough. And I'll tell you, a bigger challenge that I think I see is dealing with brokers that don't understand the mathematics involved. Like uh, a lot of brokers in the business right now have never seen a bad market. Like mm -hmm. it's never been bad for the last decade. You know, it's always been good. Um, and you know, they, you know, when they try to bring you a five and a half cap, you're just like, I, this doesn't work. And, and, and a lot of them don't understand why. So I'd say the biggest thing is, is that's a challenge too, is educating brokers on why cash on cash is important. You know, we got to make money in these things, you know, um, otherwise, you know, we can just go buy treasuries and, uh, and so, um, uh, that's a challenge too. And so the problem is when the, when the brokers, you know, when new, you know, a broker right now is used to just putting a building on the market and it's selling. Right. And there was not a lot involved in it, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, 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 the demand was so high. What has to happen now is brokers need to, not only do sellers need to be educated, but the brokers have to be educated so they can educate the seller that, Hey, here's, here's why this doesn't work. This is negative, you know, primes at eight and a quarter, you know, the yield that they're trying to get on this, that you're trying to sell this to them at is a six, like they're negative, like day one, you know what I mean? And if, and if, and if a broker can't go have that conversation with the seller, that's also part of the disconnect, right? That's the broker's job is to get that seller is to set the expectations for everyone involved. So I think there's, you know, we see a lot of deals from a lot of brokers and a lot of them don't know how to present it. And, um, so I would say any brokers listening to this, like really learn the math involved with this. And that's why, you know, we've created a whole YouTube channel for this. Like, you know, go learn the math. It'll help you sell more buildings because if you can articulate to the seller why he's being unreasonable, he might start coming down. So. Yeah. And from your time in the brokerage industry, you would have seen this as well, is that there's always that one broker that will take on a listing at any price. Right. And it might, the numbers might make sense at 5 million, just using an arbitrary example. There's a broker out there in every single market that will list that for six. And yeah. there might be a broker out there that'll list it for seven. Right. And that might not have been a bad strategy when the market was increasing, because at some point the property will get closer to that value. Maybe you're able to bridge that spread by just getting a price reduction here or there that might not be a bad strategy so it wouldn't be my strategy i don't think it's an advisable strategy but yeah. i can at least understand how the odd deal will get done but now if you're in a market where there's there's pressure on prices and even an in industrial which has been a very strong asset class there's still downward pressure on prices for interest rates so now if that property was worth five million 
And I've also noticed that owners hate losing money on real estate. They can lose money on virtually anything else. They can buy a stock, it goes to 5% and they sell and they just cut their losses. But for whatever reason, people hate losing money in real estate. So they almost anchor their expectations to what that price could have been. So now that broker comes, the property was worth 5 million. Maybe it's worth 4 million now. That broker still might take that on at 7 million. And that spread is never going to get closed. It's right. that could take decades, a divine act of God. So yeah. it, it really is important to, on for everybody to recognize that the market has shifted and it could be temporary. And, and that, that's actually kind of a good spot to jump into is where do you see interest rates going? And, and no one's got a crystal ball, of course, but any guesses on on how you see this interest rate discussion going forward? I mean, I think they raise it again, right? I mean, what was the the point was inflation, right? To mm-hmm. slow inflation. Well, every restaurant I go to and every hotel I try to book is full and expensive. So I don't feel like inflation's come down at all. Like, um, so I think they'll keep pushing it. Um, probably another 25 basis points or another 50 throughout the rest of the year, you know? Um, so that's that just it's, it, it, what people have to understand is that if the cost of capital rises, then the assets that the capital can purchase have to come down. Like it, it that's how it works. You know, it, it uh, if the cost to do things is more. Well, the, what you have to acquire has to come down. So um, the uh, I think there's going to be more interest rate hikes. I don't know. I might be wrong, but. I think you're spot on. I think that the a lot of those inflation numbers that they're that they're quoting aren't the full story. And I don't know what levers they have within that basket of goods that they analyze or how they can manipulate those numbers or if they are manipulating them. I suspect that we're not getting the full story on these sound bites that come out because I'm I agree with you. You still see luxury goods going for crazy prices and there's demand for all of these things. So the the appetite to pull that one lever of interest rates to try and tame the inflationary pressure on the other side doesn't seem to be working from from where I'm standing. So I agree. I think that this is still going to be a problem that persists uh, past 2023. Uh, who knows what happens in 2024? It seems like every year right now, we're just being hit with something different and and something unexpected. So it, it stands to reason that we might see something crazy again in 2024. But I, I, I agree. It still seems like there's a lot of inflationary pressure out there. Well, I think too, it, probably nothing really sorts itself out till after the election. You know, I think that's, that's probably a big focal point right now. Everybody's, you know, both political parties are gearing up for that right now. You know, that's, that, that's going to be a determining factor, I think. So, yeah. And that's, that's in November, I believe, right. That's when the election yeah. is. So that's, that's still a few months away, but it's that political cycle has been in high gear already for a year now. So f- to round out this last four or five months uh, and you're right, why make a decision when there could be a massive change coming in the political landscape when a lot of people might just say the cliche pencils down let's wait and see what happens yeah it's uh was it this year or next year though i think i think it's next year um oh sorry yeah you're right yeah 2024 yeah i'm already right. a year off yeah so, so yeah. i mean I, I think we could be in this limbo here for another 14 15 months or whatever you know 16 17 months whatever that is i mean i think it's i think it's gonna be sitting here but i mean like i Everywhere you go, it's packed in these major metropolitan areas. It's, you know, every restaurant's full, every, you know, and the prices just keep going up. I mean, you can't, so I, I don't know. It's not working and I, I don't know what they do. I don't know what other, like you said, what other tool in their toolkit do they have besides this to, to do something? So. so with all that uncertainty, how do you look at deals right now going forward? Um, well, you know, like I said earlier, I'd, I'd like to look at every deal standard on its own, right? Is it uh, a major market? What's the basis in the deal? Like if, you know, like we're buying a building right now that I, I you know, it, it's a hundred thousand foot building and I'm paying 26 bucks a foot for it. Like I haven't seen that number since like 2012, I think I sold a building for 18 bucks a foot to somebody that was, you know, uh, and, and there's really nothing wrong with this building. It was just timing, right? It was timing for the seller, 
timing showing up on the deal was actually kind of a mismarketed deal, I thought. And um, uh, so I'm like, basis is great. I could be half wrong. And I'm still pretty good on this, considering replacement cost is 100 bucks a foot on something like that, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, if if there's a big mark to market opportunity in the rent, you know, um, then that's something I'm going to look at, you know. Uh, and then if there's again, any kind of building with yard in these major MSAs, you know, they're just really challenging to get because of the limited zoning to get new properties like that built. No one builds a 20,000 foot building on five acres anymore, right? They build, they build a 500,000 foot building. So there's limited supply of these things in class B and C where, but you know, what I like about those buildings with yard is they usually attract a tenant that has some assets, right? They have some, they have a decent balance sheet because, you know, they need the yard to put all their equipment that they own. You know, some of our tenants are, you know, some, you know, large publicly traded oil companies, you know, Caterpillars, the Sunbelt Rentals, those types of guys, you know, that's great credit tenants, um, you know, that need that land component for their assets that uh, they have to deploy or whatever it is that they rent them out or any of those different things. So, um, so we just try to look at each deal as it stands on its own. You know, what we do is we're, we're, you know, we're moving with the market, right? Cap rates are going up. So we are trying to stabilize around 200 basis points above the market cap rate so that we have some compression going into the deal. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, we try to, we try to stabilize right now in, in the Dallas market between an eight and a half to 10% yield on costs. If it's Oklahoma City, we're going to be more of a nine and a half to 11. Um, you know, San Antonio, Austin, probably eight and a half or eight or nine to 10. So somewhere in that range. So that going in, we've we've got, you know, compression to, to sell if we need to. So, yeah, it's a good strategy because then you still have you still have a little bit of room in case the market does go go down even further. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask uh, just on on when you're looking at these deals, I, I think what's interesting is that even though there's some sellers that aren't going to be realistic with their pricing, I think that there's also going to be sellers that perhaps have to sell. And maybe they, maybe it's an owner that owns an office building and an industrial building and he's underwater on the office building. So he has to sell the, the industrial building just to, to keep, keep afloat. So those could be scenarios where there still are opportunities to, to buy it. Is your mindset right now just still look, look at everything and realize that it's going to be harder putting these deals together? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we, we track every single deal that gets brought to us and, um, we we are averaging right now we review about 50 million in opportunities um a week and so we get to see a lot in that because our deal size is anywhere usually between two and ten million so out of all that there's not a lot that you know there's a lot of deals in there so i think you know to your point like the owner that has those things i mean pe there's always an issue in real people always have, people get out you know what i mean you know they just get out of real estate they want to get out of it they want to be done you know there's always this there's always a scenario that we can find so i think the biggest thing you have to do right now is if you want to buy more deals right now is you've got to increase your lead generation you know so um we spend a lot of time like i said business developing brokers to uh increase lead generation you know and, and it's worked, you know, we, we're seeing a lot more. Um, so, uh, but, you know, you got to track those metrics to know what you're looking at, how many deals you evaluate, you know. Um, I think we, I think like last year we reviewed about 1.2 billion in deals. We offered on 255 million and we bought 56. So that's kind of the distilling process. So for me to buy more deals, I got to up the volume of deals that I see. And now in t at a time like this, you got to really up it because, you know, nine out of 10 are, are not good deals that get brought to you. So how much uh, analytics do you go into when you're looking at one of these deals? Are, are you able to quickly do some back of the envelope math and write some off? Or do yeah. you go through like an underwriting process? Yeah. So we our our top of funnel is kind of just, OK, here's a deal. What do you think about it? Um, OK, if it passes the I like the area, you know, I like the functionality of the building, you know, is it 12 foot clear? I'm out. You know what I mean? Like I, I've seen the challenges of having a 12 foot clear listing. Um, 
And so, um, uh, the, uh, so we'll just do a real quick back the napkin. Okay. Well, what's the story? Is it vacant? Okay, great. What can we lease it for? What does the guy want? Okay. All right. That sounds pretty good. Okay. Now let's fully underwrite it, you know? And then, so then it'll go to the underwriting process and then pass the underwriting process passes our underwrite and then we will take it to either a um we'll either make an offer or go tour it I, I try to tour most properties before i make an offer on them um but sometimes it's not the case so you just got to make an offer um so uh and then past that then we negotiate and get there if we can um but but yeah we we, we eliminate a lot real quickly just back in the napkin so if we can go back to that one comment you made about 12 foot ceilings and I couldn't agree with you more on that, that that is a functional obsolescence that makes it very difficult to, uh, to lease or even sell down the road. What is your preferred height that you want to see on a building? I, I like 16, uh, on freestanding on single tenant asset, just because you are buying a building with some kind of land component and a grade level yard and 16 allows you to pull a truck in there. Um, put a 14 foot door and pull a truck in. Um, and then, um, on the small base stuff, I'd like to see, you know, 14 foot clear minimum. You, you, you can maybe get a, I don't think we have anything that's 12, no, like 14 foot minimum on that stuff. So are there any other things that are instant deal breakers for you that that's specific to the building beyond ceiling height? Uh, specific to the building, uh, lack of parking, you know, if you can't park it, um, if, uh, you know, if it's really hard to get to sometimes these buildings, you know, you gotta like, you, you gotta know where to exit and know how to actually get there. If it becomes, if, I don't know if there's like a specific thing, but if, if there's like friction, if there's any kind of friction going into the deal, like just the way you approach the property, the way you, uh, navigate around the property. Uh, those things start irritating me in a way. And it's like, you know, if I'm a tenant, do I got to deal with this? You know, um, you know, so that's, or, or, you know, not, you know, if it's like a multi-tenant park and, you know, I can't, I can't load because a truck would take up all the parking lot and I'll be fighting with my neighbor all the time. Right. About trucks being out there. So, just little nuances like that, that if I was a tenant, would I want to live with this, you know, and, and, and if I get that feeling, then I, it really lessens my interest in the property. So what's your position on environmentals? Do you, I'm, I'm assuming you do a basic phase one uh, and ideally everyone wants to see a phase one that there's no further testing recommended. Do you ever mm -hmm. go into the scenario where you have to do a phase two? Yeah, no, I mean, we just we just completed a phase two on that hundred thousand foot building that we were buying. Um, you know, uh, you know, if that, I kind of planned on that going in. I, I felt like this building was going to warrant that. Um, there's been some instances where, you know, I've been recommended to go to a phase two. I mean, if someone tells me to go to a phase two, I'm always going to go do it. Right. It's not. It, it, a phase two costs 10 grand. Right. In the scheme of things, that's not a lot of money. Um you know, we capitalize it in the deal anyways, you know, now if it doesn't pass, it sucks for me because I eat 10 grand because um, I don't call my partners for, you know, deals that don't make. And um, but uh, but yeah, no, I, I just kind of rely on the environmental guy, uh, Joey, our COO. He's really into environmental, but, you know, he's an engineer by trade. And so that's his his world. So he'll he'll dig pretty deep on those um, and. Uh, Cause he's, he's all about mitigating risk. I'm kind of more 30,000 feet. Does the building work? Okay. You know, all these deal points hit great. You know, I've seen this, I've ran this lap before at this building. I know what's going to happen. Um, you know, so, but yeah, we're always doing a phase one and then phase two, if it's recommended. So. One point you made earlier was uh, limited CapEx uh, on these spaces. One still large CapEx that could be there is the roof. Uh, and, yeah. and I've I bought a property that we had to do the roof on and it, it blew my mind at how expensive it was to actually do that roof. Yeah. Uh, it, where do you factor that in? Are you you're doing a property condition report and figuring out where everything's at? Is that just become a, another deal metric where if the roof has to be replaced right now, then you're budgeting for it. That's part of the purchase price. What happens when there's a roof issue five years out? 
Well, it, you know, you know this real estate brokerage, you live and die by a roof on sales. I mean, it, it's the number one deal killer in a deal. You know, I mean, it, it kills it every time. Um, uh, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, obviously I'm getting on Google Earth before I tour the building and, and you can kind of tell, OK, this one's really old. This one's really, you know, it's not that good, you know. Um, so I'm I'm budgeting for that going in, um, you know, uh, when, when I was listing a lot of buildings and I knew I had a bad roof, what I would do on that end of it is I would get the roof inspected before I listed it. And that way I would hand the roof report to the potential buyers and say, offer accordingly. This is the condition of the roof, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, if there's going to be roof problems five to seven years down the road, then, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to try to factor that into the, the final purchase price somehow with the seller. Um, you know, cause a lot of times the seller will tell you the roof is just fine. You get in there and, you know, it's, it's got three years left on it. So, you know, we'll, 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 we'll probably go at, back and ask for some monies for that to allocate, you know, or reduce the purchase price to account for that down the road. Um, and then at that point, once we take it over, we'll just really do a job of, you know, annual, you know, probably biannual inspections on it and just keep our eyes on it, keep it going as long as we can. Um, sometimes depends on what's the, what, what's the strategy on the exit for the property too, you know? Um, but sometimes you have to go straight into it. Otherwise, you know, your insurance policies, you know, probably sometimes predicated on you putting the new roof on and you got a certain amount of time to do it and, uh, and, and show them that you did it. So, or they'll terminate your insurance. So. It's such a great point, and I'm glad you uh, you went into that detail. And I love the point: uh, brokers live and die by the roof, and that's so true. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a question come in from Max: How does Jeremy find and get deals? Just before you get to that, uh, Jeremy, uh, thanks for the question, Max. Appreciate you joining in and asking. Uh, if anyone else has questions for Jeremy, please put it into the chat as well. I, I think you answered that one already. By 99% of the deals come from brokers, so I want to actually change Max's question in a little bit and ask you how somebody not in your position could find deals so you've got a you've got a guy that's business development who's doing a lot of broker outreach you've already got a system in place you've already got a platform where you're getting a lot of deals coming to you how could someone that isn't in your position perhaps they're starting out perhaps it's a broker perhaps it's just someone that's interested in industrial and they want to start finding deals how would you recommend to them that they start finding deals well um I would I would start cold calling brokers. You know, you can cold call owners directly too. You know, if you're a broker already in in um, in the space, you know, find every broker. So every broker that works with me and sells me a building has the opportunity to invest in my deal with me too. So if you find a deal, find a find a syndicator like me that'll let you invest in the deal with you. You know, and and I always let them keep the leasing on it, and I let them you know, sell it for me. Most likely if we have to do a portfolio sale, that might be different, but I'll usually cut them some skin in there just for it anyways, when we do exit, because that's how I, I expected to be treated when I was brokering. And, um, you know, so if you're an existing broker, find it, you know, and you want to get into owning property, well, I mean, that's that you be a bird dog, right? Bring good deals to a, a sponsor and uh, find the sponsor that'll let you invest in deals. Um, you know, if you're just getting started in the space, then, I mean, you need to go, you're going to have to go cold call brokers and they're not going to return your phone call because they have no clue who you are. So you're going to have to, just as, you know, just as I started in my brokerage career, cold calling on a guy for five years before a deal happens, you know, you got to go, you got to go develop that, that you're in this game and you want to do it and you're capitalized. And, um, and I, I would almost say too, I mean, it seems like a lot of brokers, I mean, they don't want you to like go wine them and dine them all the time. They don't really have time for it. Um, I think, I think you need to have a very clear and concise buyer's box and tell them what you want to buy. You need to educate yourself too, because the biggest challenge on for a broker is for a newbie to step in and then they got to, then they have to hold your hand and teach you through the process. They don't want to do that when they can easily just go sell it to a guy like me. That's like, okay, cool. They're like, hey, we're under contract. What do you need me to do? I'm like, nothing. Get out of my way. Like, I know what I'm doing. Um, so that's that's something you got to overcome. So, you know, maybe that's try to go work somewhere at a shop or something that buys deals for a while before you try to go out and do it on your own. But 
I, I think that's the biggest thing you're going to have to overcome is that you actually know and understand the space. Because if a broker has to explain it to you on every single deal they bring you, you're going to exhaust them and they're not, they're just going to go take it to someone else. So. And, and equally as important to that, just piggybacking on that, is that you run the high risk of making a bad mistake uh, yeah. if you're buying a deal that has perhaps been shopped over by all the smart money and you're looking at a deal now that that came across your desk and you're, you're not sure what you're doing and you're rushing into it. There's a high probability that you're overlooking something that everybody else caught. Uh, and that that's where mistakes get made. That's where industrial real estate goes from being a very... Uh, profitable and lucrative endeavor to being one that's very disproportionately risky compared to buying like a multifamily property. So I, I, I agree. I, I, I'd stress that as well is that you said, it, you know, spend time calling people and you've got to take that time. You got to really build those relationships uh, versus just thinking you want to invest in industrial real estate. So you can go onto a database and look at 10 potential opportunities and pick one that you like. That's, that's not at all how, how no. that process is going to work. No. What, what, what else would you say to to someone that's considering investing? So let's assume that they have built some relationships. They've, they're starting to see some deals. They're comfortable in that space. They found one that they like. What else would you recommend that they do to ensure they're reducing the risk as much as possible? Um, well, I mean, just really have the strategy in place before you go under contract. Like, you know, it, have have have. The biggest thing I do when I look at a piece of property is I have the end in mind at the beginning. You know, how am I getting out of this? Right. And so if you have multiple exit strategies, that's a good way to look at it. Okay, I can lease this and make this on cash flow. And if I'm and if I'm half wrong, I'm still pretty right. That so that feels kind of good. I always kind of do that in my mind. If I'm half wrong, I'm still right enough, you know. So this this feels pretty good. Um, you know. But I, I can't emphasize basis enough. You buy a bad basis going in, you can't you can't fix that going out. Like it, so, um, make sure you know the market comps, and you know, and, and in Texas, it's pretty tough because it's non disclosure state. So um, you know, you don't really know what anything's trading at. So you've got to develop rapport with a good broker that has good comps that can help you know give those to you and 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 help you evaluate that. So I'd say, I'd say you can overcome base. You can overcome anything with basis at the end of the day. And that's what we kind of solve for, because, you know, sometimes we look at some of our exits, you know, we, we, sometimes we feel we find a good basis going in. And then when we look at the exit on it, we don't like the basis on the exit to the next guy. And that sometimes kills a deal for us. Cause I'm like, man, I don't know if I can get out of this. Like, you know, I'm buying the building for 120 a foot and I'm going to try to sell it to this guy at 190. Like, I know this neighborhood. This neighborhood ain't getting 190 in the next five years. It ain't happening, you know. So that could kill a deal, too, you know, is looking at the exit assumption. When you're looking at that basis, is there a percentage that you want to be under or is it a gut feeling? Uh, a lot of it's gut. I mean, I'm just done a lot of them, you know, um, I look at replacement cost a little bit, like, um, you know, I mean, if I had to go recreate it, you know, what would it take? And if I'm significantly, significantly below that, then I feel really good about it. Um, because the next guy will buy that thesis as well. Um, uh, but a lot of it's gut, you know, you just, you start when you see as many deals as we see, you just, you're, you know, you're curating an eye, right? So, I mean, that's, that's why we track deal flow so hard. We know exactly how much is coming to us that. And so like, you know, we had our annual investor meeting last week and I could tell them like, I want you all to understand this is, this is our eye. This is the eye we've, we are developing for these properties and it's by evaluating this much in deals. So I think it's, you know, uh, if you measure those things that you can manage, you know, it, 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 it helps us really just tell a broker within 24 hours, whether we're buying a deal or not. You know, or we want to go look at it, you know, because that's the other thing, too. You know, for someone trying to get into this industry, you know, broker brings you a deal and you want to toy around with it for a week before you even looking at making an offer. Man, they're, they're going to lose steam. So I'm trying to be like, uh, no, yes, no, yes. Hey, we'll go tour that, you know. So we try to move really quickly on that side because I know that's what they want to see because they want to take it to the next guy if you don't want it, you know. So, um but yeah, basis for the most part is, is just gut feel, you know, um, on that. So, yeah. Oh, and, and you just 
like you said, you have to look at a whole lot of deals to get that understanding of it and, and develop almost a sixth sense when it comes to, to that gut feeling on it. Right. So you're, you're looking to do another 56 million to match last year in, in acquisitions. What's the long-term outlook for, not, not necessarily from Adidor Capital, but what's your long-term outlook for just the industrial real estate market? Um, I mean, I think it's, always going to be here. I think the good thing about it is it's still a very new space to a lot of people, you know, um, especially the world I play in. So I, I feel like that's good for me. You know, they just finally put an acronym to it called iOS, I guess. And now it's like a institutionally safe product, you know, when these guys wouldn't touch this stuff five years ago. Um, so I think there's still a lot of learning curve for them to go along. So there's a lot of arbitrage in there for me to make money on it. Um, but I think long term industrial, you're going to need you always need industrial. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, you know. A spe bulk distribution will always be there. You're going to need that, especially the way we buy things now. And then, you know, the smaller bay and, and the other things, uh, they they service rooftops. You know what I mean? We're, we always got to have somewhere to live. So someone's got to fix what you, where you live or, you know, or service that. So I, I feel, I feel like it's got pretty good runway in it. So. Well, we'll have to keep this conversation going and maybe uh, touch base again in a year or so and, yeah. and see how you know, things are going. I, I'm with you. I, I, I'm optimistic on it. I think that there could be some short term hurdles and, and some discomfort or pain uh, in the near future, just as, people shuffle out on this interest rate and, and there's an adjustment in overall valuations. Uh, but long term, I'm, I'm still with you. I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've got a, a link to your LinkedIn uh, and Matador Capital's website in the description. I encourage people to reach out to you and connect. Uh, and then tell me a little bit more about the YouTube channel. Yeah, so I created a YouTube channel just honestly for my investors, because a lot of people don't understand how a syndicated deal works and how preferred returns work and promotes and things like that. And so I, um, I created a channel literally just to educate my investors, right? Uh, if you have any questions and, uh, it's just, I can point you there, which is kind of funny how it's worked out is, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of brokerages here in town now are like, oh, hey, I just take your videos and I show them to my employees and they have a question on this this topic, you know. And so uh, in those videos, it's just a lot about how we evaluate deals, how we look at them. So, you know, I've um, I've kind of I've kind of given you my playbook. Right. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is how we look at it. My whole what happened was is is. A lot of that came stemmed from I had one of my clients, one of my brokerage clients told me to tell me, hey, I want to invest in real estate. I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean? Do you want to invest or you want to operate? He goes, well, I don't know what that means. I go, well, I operate. Like, I, I do it all. Or you, So I can sell you a building and you can go do it all. Or you can just invest with me and I'll do it all. And he's like, okay, that sounds better. I'll just do that. So, <laughs> you know, so, um, but at the same time, if you want to know about it, this is, this is all the things that we do to operate buildings. So I don't mind giving my playbook out because it's a lot of work, you know, so it's there to educate people. It's there also to attract new investors to be like, okay, I don't want to go do all this. Let me just give it to this guy because he's an expert and and let's let's go that route. So <laughs> I'll I'll put your YouTube channel, I'll pin that in the description below so people can go and, and check that out. It's uh, yeah. there, there's not a whole lot of resources out there for uh, industrial real estate. So to to have more content out there is very welcoming and I'm sure a lot of people will get value from it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Cool. Well, uh, th thanks, Jeremy. I really appreciate you uh, spending an hour with me and uh, lifting the hood on the on the, the car that you've got going there. That's impressive. Yeah. I love seeing the growth that you guys have had. And and I, I wish you nothing but continued success as you keep growing that portfolio. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. So. Well, and next time in Dallas, I'll, I'll reach out and we'll, uh, tr we'll try yeah. and grab a coffee as well. It'd be uh, great to connect in person. Yeah, please do. Please do. So. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Well, yeah, I encourage everybody to, to reach out with Jeremy. We'll put uh, his YouTube channel in the description here shortly as well. And uh, if you enjoyed this, please leave us a thumbs up. Uh, if you didn't like this, leave us a thumbs down. I always like feedback of any kind and uh, comments are always welcomed as well. Uh, but Jeremy, thanks again. Really do appreciate it. And we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate thanks, it. Yep. Bye.